Today I'm very excited to welcome Maria Arena to discuss her new book, Latino Land, a portrait of America's largest and least understood minority. Maria Arena is the author of the memoir, American Chicana, Chica, a finalist for the National Book Award, two novels, Cellophane and Lima Nights, the prize-winning biography, Bolivar, Silver, Sword and Stone, a narrative story of Latin America, and The Writing Life, a collection from her well-known column for the Washington Post. She's the inaugural literary director of the Library of Congress. She was born in Lima, Peru, and currently lives in Washington, D.C. and Lima, Peru. Today, she's joined by Jorge Samanillo. Jorge Samanillo is the founding director behind the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Latino, which Congress established in December 2020 to illuminate the inevitable contributions of Latinos to the United States. Previously, he was the executive director and CEO of History in Miami Museum, he joined the museum in 2000 as a curator and subsequently served in several leadership positions before becoming its director. He currently serves as the board chair of the American Alliance of Museums. Born in New York City, Samanillo grew up in Miami and currently lives in DC. Uh, additionally, we want to mention that the event is in partnership with Kama DC, and we have one of the presenters here to say a couple of words. Thanks so much. Kama DC is a grassroots organization in Washington DC, which provides a platform for immigrants in the DMV area to share their skills and stories. Kama DC is run entirely by volunteers who are passionate about building ties, facilitating cultural exchanges and starting conversations. We highlight the skills and stories that immigrants bring to our community by hosting skills-based workshops, cooking classes, storytelling nights, film screenings, and more. So if you want to know more, I'll be hanging out uh, for the entirety of the event, you can come find me. And it's really exciting to be here again with Politics and Prose. We love uh, having events with them. And uh, yeah, we look forward to a lot more events in the future. And without further ado, uh, Marie and Jorge. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, you can hear me okay, right? Yes, sir. I probably don't need this. Um, I am honored to, <laughs> yeah, my throat will get tired. I'm honored to be here today. And thank you, Marie, for, for inviting me to, to join you and, and, and join all of you today for this special evening. Um, when I first uh, arrived here in DC uh, a little less than two years ago, one of the first people to reach out to me was Marie and invited us and hosted a lunch for us to get to know the DC community. So I'm grateful to her. And uh, actually one of the first people reached out to me when I was in Miami to do this interview for her book. So thank you, Marie. Oh, it's such a pleasure, yeah. um, Jorge. It, first of all, let me say, it's a, not only a pleasure, but a real honor. Um, Jorge is doing uh, what I think is the impossible um, I was able to get a fragment of the Latino population in this book. Um, he is doing it for all of us and uh, in a such a monumental way. So Jorge, thank you for all your work. It's not anything that we're going to see for another, what, 10 years? Hopefully 10. 10 years. <laughs> but I'm, I'm so grateful to you for t undertaking that huge and, and, and truly important um, venture. For us. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're going to keep this casual today, it's very conversational, and um, and we'll take some questions uh, towards the last quarter of the program. But I wanted to open up, Marie, and just uh, give everybody a little background on, on why you took on this uh, project in Latino land, because it is not an easy question to to answer. I think you tackled it throughout the book on, on identity, right? What it means to be Latino, something that we've been tackling in the museum for, for years now. So can you give us a little bit of background? Absolutely. This this has been a very passionate mission for me. Uh, I think probably for more than 20 years now, probably about 22, 23 years, uh, when I was working at the Washington Post and I was the books editor there, and I was uh, being pulled aside to do pieces on the Latino population uh, at the time. There weren't very many people who could speak Spanish at the paper. I think I might have been the only one who wasn't in a menial job at the post. And so I was sent out to talk to, even though I was doing the book section, um, being sent out to talk to um, migrant workers and people in the community. And I realized uh, then that it was kind of a discovery for me because I hadn't really paid attention to my Latinidad, to my Hispanicity, 
um, until I was asked to. And it was then, I think, that I began to realize that this not only was a hole in the uh, sort of American um, consciousness, but that it was, um, there, were, there were few people stepping up to do it. Every book that I have done, Jorge, has been a building block, a brick in that project. And what I found that is kind of daunting is that every time I did a book, it would dilate to be something bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and um, it started with me, with a memoir, American Chica. And then, um, you know, it went to a, an epic novel set in the Peruvian jungle, and then a fierce little slim, um, slender novel about a love affair in an urban setting in Peru. And then um, the uh, biography of Bolivar, which was something that would take in a whole geography, um, six republics that he liberated, and um, 300 years of history because his family had been in uh, this hemisphere for that long. And then from there, it got even bigger and I decided to do the Latin America as a whole. What was it about Latin America that lived today, that lived way back when, um, at the time of the conquest? What were the, what were, were the characteristics that had survived? And then, um, and then I started to think, well, that was my editor sort of nudged me to this decision, is look, you've got 64 million Latinos here. Uh, it's a Latin America unto itself. Why don't you write about that? And so I undertook it in a crazy way, not realizing that I could only capture part of it. But it, it has been an extraordinary uh, trip. And I've gotten to meet so many people at every level of the um, Latino population. And it has been enormously rewarding. Excellent. Well, as I read your book, it, you, the narrative, the stories are, are, are really what carries the whole book, right? The personal accounts, uh, the interviews, uh, which makes it unique because you get to discover all these new people that you didn't know about before throughout the, you know, throughout the United States. Um, were there any surprises when you were doing these interviews? Anything that really stood out to you that you didn't know that really came to light? I think every one uh, was a marvel to me. I, I did 237 wow. interviews for this book. Um, and I was able to, when I actually narrowed it down, I probably used about 65, um, somewhere between 65 and 80 people that I actually narrowed it down to. And what I wanted to do was to keep going, to dolly out, um, to tell something of the history and something of the, of the massive sort of population movements. And, and what made us the way that we are, the very different ways that we are, and, and, and the ways that we're the same, and at the same time tell personal stories. Um, and the, I have really had the great good fortune of being able to find people who were enormously interesting and enormously individual, uh, from great pickers in California to um, CEOs of major corporations to artists, to poets, to dancers, to um, to machinists, and uh, uh, just at every level. So um, that has been what has been surprising to me is the amazing perseverance, I think, of this tribe, um, the, the, the very high standards for themselves in work, especially, um, and in family, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, none of that, of course, was a surprise because I experienced that in my own in my own world. But uh, I think what impressed me the most was the the extraordinary um, vibrance and and um, uh, just drive. I would say. And how, I'm just curious. How did you set about to to find all the you know selected interviews or? So that's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. It is a lot. I asked everybody I knew yeah. to give me the names of everybody uh, that they could think of who had an interesting story. And sometimes I would find them in the pages of a newspaper and I would look them up. Uh, sometimes I would um, stumble on them on the street. Um, I would go up to construction workers and talk to them. I um, would ask a 
uh, handyman. What was the, who was the most in interesting, he was from Honduras, for instance, who was the most interesting Honduras um, friend that he had, and it turned out to be somebody who had um, been shot by a gun to his temple, um, knocked out an eye at a bar in uh, Tegucigalpa. And the story of this is a biologist, uh, an ocean oceanographer, um, and his story was so representative of the violence that's go that was going on in Honduras at the time that he was just uh, a perfect cameo. Um, so it was like that, stumbling you know, into people and having somebody say, you really should meet so-and-so, you should really talk to so-and-so, to and, -so, and, um, and just being lucky. Right. You know, as, as we build our museum uh, over the next decade, We'll be doing some of this field work, this groundwork, uh, you know, trying to find the right stories to tell that uh, narrative, that program. But, you know, what is this going to look like? You know, what is how are we going to identify what it means to be Latino in the United States? Uh, so the book's very helpful, by the way. <laughs> I had to cheat sheets here, but uh, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to. <laughs> no, it's, to it's really research. great because because you, you touch on some things in there that are so uh, complicated, including regionalism. You know, uh, growing up in Miami versus growing up in D.C. or New York, L.A., and how that affects or how it defines who we are. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? An enormous diversity, as we all know. How many of you are Latinos, have a Latino background? Wow. Okay, so you know, and you know that each one of your stories is going to be is going to be different, and is 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 a, a, a very individual story, depending on where you've been, depending on where you've come. Um, the the grid is huge. Um, so what I wanted to find out was not only the, the the things about those populations that we already know. I mean, we know that uh, Cubans are in Miami, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans are in New York, Mexicans are in the Southwest. Um, but that only tells part of the tale. I mean, there are reasons for people moving about. And I think when they moved about, Jorge, what I found was that they began to think of themselves more as Latinos um, and, uh, and to find more unity in that. Because by the end of the day, um, you are drawn to people who speak Spanish, who are from south of the border somewhere, whose um, ancestors, even if your family has been here for generations, whose ancestors had something in common. Um, and I think that that, um, uh, that aspect of it was enormously interesting to me as well. Yeah. You mentioned um, in the book at, at the end when you, when you mentioned the interview you did with me, because we have something in common. We love uh, DNA testing and 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Yeah, I, I know the whole world has my information. I don't mind. But uh, it's, um, but the reason I use it is because it is one way to find commonalities. If my grandparents came from Spain, they migrated to Cuba. I know my grandfather had seven other brothers and sisters, and they went to Venezuela, Mexico, and Argentina. And of course, now I know where my second and third cousins are, and I keep on looking them up, and we communicate. And I met a couple of them. And it's amazing the commonalities and the things that we share, even though we grew up in different countries. And but we all ended up in the United States now. And we can look back and see our common ancestry, but still keep your heritage, right? Your cultural uh, ties and, and, and how you grew up in the different regions. But it's always fascinating to me. And I know you have an interest in this. Um, you know, how do we keep that cultural identity and, and still celebrate that? But at the same time, celebrate, celebrate being an American Latino, U.S. Latino. Right. That's, that's a huge question and certainly a huge question for you. Um, the, the diversity, of course, of the Latino population uh, is obvious and it's concrete and there's no way around it. But the, um, and it's, it's very true what you say because, um, you know, it ends up that uh, we are such a mix, our DNA is so mixed and it's so, and the, the, the movement of the populations in this hemisphere have been so, so um, fluid that I, I, we do. I mean, in my family, uh, if I look at 23andMe as well, there's family in, in, in Costa Rica, there's family in Argentina, there's certainly family in Chile and, and Bolivia and around Peru, where I was born. Um, but there's also this, this sense that um, we, we are related by so many 
things other than DNA. Right. We're, we're related by our co the colonial past, which unites us. We are um, related in a way, in a very funny way, by the way Spain tried to um, keep its conquest alive by separating us so that we became these vice royalties and then these republics that um, went to war with each other because we didn't think we knew each other. In the United States, and uh, you know, this was Simon Bolivar's dream uh, that uh, at some point the all of Latin America would unite and be really a strong, um, unbeatable force in in the world. And I sometimes think that we achieve that in this country. I mean, the the um, the 64 million uh, Latinos who are here who have ceased to call themselves Panamanians or, or Nicaraguans or wherever they're actually from and, and do become Americans of a Latino background, actually achieve a kind of unity that is not um, possible in the rest of the hemisphere in those separate countries. That's interesting. You know, I, I, I grew up in South Florida. I moved there from New York when I was seven and we grew up with the term Hispanic or you were Cuban American or you were Cuban. Um, when I got there in 76, it was mostly you know, some Puerto Rican, some Cuban, and everyone else spoke English, right? And then little by little, it became very uh, international, where I couldn't recognize where people were from anymore. It was very difficult, but it was great to have that diversity growing up in the 80s and 90s there. Uh, but I always felt like we were in a bubble. In South Florida, if you've been there, you, you are kind of in a bubble. You don't realize what's going on in the rest of the world because it's like cut off from the rest of Florida, really. It's like South Florida and the rest. <laughs> um, but, you know, that affects the way we grew up. And then uh, as you travel and you get to know the rest of the United States, you realize there's another term, Latino. And what does that mean? And of course, these are all constructs, right? These are all census uh, tags that gave us ways to make sure that, you know, you vote for Nixon in the 70s or <laughs> whatever it is you do, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, those labels and, and what they mean for certain people and what they don't mean for certain people? Absolutely. Yeah. My, my book begins with a prologue that um, begins that we are a population with no name because we've been given so many names. I mean, with a, a Latino comes from really from uh, Napoleon's ambitions to uh, plant himself in this hemisphere. And when he was when he had designs on the North American continent. And, you know, at the point where he had, uh, where he had invaded and conquered Spain, and he thought he might um, actually have, uh, create a bulwark in, in uh, the Americas. Um, the, there was a whole uh, mission to get people to think of themselves as Latin and therefore French, therefore somewhat European. And so uh, the word Latino and uh, Latin became part of, of who we were, but it was imposed on us by Napoleon. Uh, and then, you know, come uh, the 70s and Nixon, uh, he gave us the name, he baptized us Hispanics. Uh, and he was sure, having grown up in California alongside, his father was a grocer, um, and worked with Latino agricultural workers and, and um, uh, braceros who came over the border to, to work in the fruit farms, which is where Nixon's uh, father um, was. Uh, those, uh, uh, he decided that this, was a this could be a political group. And, and so he baptized us Hispanic. And now we are baptized um, by the, some circles, academic circles, those who feel that we should be uh, gender aware, uh, Latinx, uh, and others who have, who have rejected Latinx uh, now call us Latine. The Juno Diaz calls us Latine. Um, and so we have all of these names and virtually no name. Um, so um, I start with that, but you know, that, that's um, sort of the effervescence, if you want to call it, of the culture. Um, we are so, uh, we are diverse in so many ways, but you know, the, the, the media has now called us Latinos. And so this, I think, may stick. <laughs> although I have to say, although I have to say right away, right away, that there are extraordinary, um, organizations 
uh, even in the city, the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Is anybody here from the Hispanic Heritage Foundation? There you go. Um, <laughs> ah, Antonio. Okay, this is the great leader who's doing worlds of work for the um, Hispanic Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, and um, yeah, Hispanic is a perfectly good word for who we are. Um, and <laughs> and um, you know, LULAC, which is calls his, I mean, in the title of LULAC, which is one of the one of the great uh, southwestern organizations that that unites us in many ways, um, is the word Latin American. So you know, we are we are all things, um, and yet one. So, so you think it'll stick? I was going to ask you next. What's the next iteration, or what is a uh... I know that you interviewed Marco Davis in your in your book, and he was saying, "Why are why aren't we a race? You know, is it, how do we keep on you know, just all these labels that others give us, right? How do we identify ourselves?" And you look at the census count, and you look at who identifies as Hispanic or Latino, and it was always very confusing for me. It was uh, you were white or white non non Hispanic or Hispanic white, and like there's so many different things. And you're talking about ethnicity, race. You're talking about all these different social constructs that don't really make sense when you're trying to check a box. Um, is there, is there anything, any, any other thoughts on that or, or what's, what are we better off using <laughs> moving forward? In other words, cause I, I, I feel like even though we're 63 million strong, that number fluctuates, uh, if anyone takes a survey and uses the wrong box. That's absolutely true. Right. And, and, and some people say it's underestimated because right. people don't declare. I mean, there are people, um, I know my own children who are of course part, part Hispanic, their father is not. Um, they are shy to say that they're Hispanics or Latinos because um, my daughter, for instance, doesn't speak Spanish, uh, and she's um, she's shy to take that to to um, insist on that label when um, she's not recognized as being Latina. So I think that you know that whole business of of race is really interesting. Uh, very few people realize that, for instance, when uh, during Manifest Destiny, when when the push westward happened, and the lands that were uh, were formerly owned by the Spanish colony, and before that, of course, the indigenous um, uh, uh, Central American tribes, um, when they were pushed out, and the uh, settlers started taking over their lands. And eventually, um, there were enough settlers so that um, much of Mexico, half of Mexico, uh, became Americans. And then the Americans uh, had a war, the Spanish-American War, won the war. And then the United States paid some money uh, to Mexico for just cleaning up that deal, which was a very uh, which was nothing less than an incursion in another land. I mean, you talk about um, uh, about elbow room, um, but we did it in this country. Those people who stayed, those Mexicans who stayed, insisted that um, they be called white. Um, and they insisted, why did they insist that they be called white? So, because they knew that there was a binary distinction in the United States and whites could vote and blacks could not. And if they were anything but white, they would not be allowed to vote and they, they needed to vote. So that was made very, very clear. And so race from the very beginning was an issue, you know, and it was made an issue because of the binary notion of race. But in fact, uh, Latinos are all races. We are all races of man. And um, the the uh, uh, many of us are mixed race. I mean, I don't know about your DNA, Jorge, but mine is uh, every race of man is uh, I carry in me. And from from you know almost 500 years of my family in uh, in this hemisphere, there's bound to be uh, race mixing. Um, it is an extraordinary experiment in this world um, that so many races would have mixed in the Latino population. Uh, it has happened nowhere else in the same way as it has happened in this hemisphere with Latinos. Nice. I'm trying to think, um, you, you touched on a little bit uh, for um, race and, and racism. 
uh, when you were doing your interviews, <laughs> did any story stand out that really, you know, touched upon, you know, the issues oh. with racism across, oh. you know, not only to us, but internally in the community? Oh, tremendous, tremendous. Um, and um, humiliating stories of race, of veterans who come back, for instance, from winning Purple Hearts and, and uh, Medals of Glory in the battlefield and come back and cannot be served in a restaurant in their hometown. Um, uh, uh, race plays a very, very huge part. And, and, and even within our population, there is racism. I mean, there are um, e elites who come from countries where whites are the elites, um, and uh, they, you know, are given a very different education in in the United States of America, and they adjust. They need to adjust. I mean, and and, um, and very often they don't. And um, and we can be as racist. I mean, I think the Latin the Latinos can be as racist as anybody else. Absolutely. Even though we are mixed race, even though we may not know we are mixed race. I have friends who, when they did their DNA, did not realize that they were a very large percentage of um, African, of Afro-Latinos. And they didn't know it until they did their DNA. And then it would suddenly change their whole heads about, the, uh, about who they were and where they came from and what that meant. Yeah. Just touch on the racism, you know, I was telling you earlier about living in that bubble in South Florida and growing up, I didn't realize what racism was. Uh, but in the 80s, even in the 90s, I remember South Florida, they were trying to pass English only laws. And everybody's like, well, everybody just wants to speak one language. It's like, no, there was, an, there, there was a reason they were trying to do that. And then I went to school and I moved to Tallahassee. And the first week I was there, there was a Klan parade right down the main street, right through campus. And I realized I was in a different world, right? This is the deep south. And uh, immediately, people I met in class were referring to me as something else. You know, they were, you know, they had other names for me or where I was from. And the first thing they asked you, of course, I think you mentioned this in your book, trying to identify, do, do you do certain things? I can't believe you're Cuban, you're not black. You know, you're, if you're or, you know, do you dress a certain way you, when you go back to Peru, right? And, you know, these questions that people ask you, and sometimes they're ignorant, sometimes it's, you know, on purpose. Uh, but I'll tell you one more example. It happens all the time. We were traveling to, to France a few years ago when we were leaving the airport and it pulled us aside and we were being questioned like for half an hour. We almost missed our flight. And uh, my daughter is very fair skinned, blonde, light eyes, uh, like her mom. And uh, they thought we were smuggling kids. Yeah. <coughs> they profiled her, they racially profiled her, they pulled us aside and finally they admitted that's what they thought they were. So they were, my daughter was 15, 16 years old and they're questioning what she did for a living, where she lived you know, who were her, where she worked. And she's like 15 years old, but it was, you know, it's incredible, but you can still face this in today's world and across the world, right? It happens everywhere. But that's when my daughter finally realized, you know, she said, you know, I, I'm Hispanic, I'm Cuban, you know, and this, it hurt. It really actually hurt her because she realized that, you know, she was living in a bubble in South Florida, not realizing that other people looked at her a different way or looked at us a different way. And she got away with it because of her looks. So it's, it's always something you think about, but it's still so pervasive. And I know in our community that has led to people trying to assimilate, you know, the way they use their names, the way they uh, they call themselves white or not, you know, non-Hispanic and they check off the wrong box or the right box for them. Uh, so it does affect how we grow up. Um, any other you know, reference to that? In your well, account? absolutely. I mean, I remember coming as a, a nine year old child and first of all, um, walking into a bus station, which we did in Miami, landing in Miami and then walking into a bus station so we could take a bus all the way to Wyoming, um, and <laughs> which we did. That's an easy um, way. <laughs> buses, I should say. But stopping in the, in, in the bus stations and seeing, you know, uh, colored go this way, whites go this way. And I honestly didn't know where to go um, and I, until my mother pulled me in one direction. But, um, you know, that that sort of um, a surprise, I think, as a child and then and then coming into finally, we settled in Summit, New Jersey and um, having a, a fellow student, a, a, a little girl who lived down the street and went to the same um, school as I did um, say, boy, you stink. You know, you 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 stink. You wouldn't you go home where you came from? I mean, l that sort of um extraordinary uh kind of uh humiliating event i think that happens 
to to so many of us. Um, and it could be because your accent is not right, because your right. grammar is not right, because you look different, uh, any number of things. But yeah, there are humiliations, uh, or there were. When I came, there were two million Latinos or Hispanics count countable uh, in this country, and now there are 64 million. So, you know, the, the, um, the change in my lifetime, your lifetime, yeah. has been huge, huge. Definitely, definitely. amazing. Um, so, so you've done all this work, uh, kind of, you know, you did all the background, you laid the foundation with your previous books. Uh, what's next for you in writing? Have you tackled the tough question? Is this it? Did you get? Did you come to a conclusion on who we are and where we're heading, or is this something else? Um. You can't come to conclusions yeah. with the Latino population. Sorry about that, Jorge. If you if if you're asked to, I need the answer. You're not for my... <laughs> yeah. um, no, there's there's no conclusion. We are. Uh, I think we are going to be molting even as we go. I mean, we we are the population in this country. Nobody knows us more than is that Ray, Ray Suarez sitting standing right there, who's doing a, a book on on immigration as a whole. We are um, the, the group in these United States that intermarries more than anybody else. Um, and it's, it's not unusual for us to have children who don't look like us, uh, as you experienced yourself in, in the airport, um, and I experience as well. So um, that is, uh, we're going to be different. We are going to be different in 10 years when you open that museum, Jorge. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be different. We are, we are going to be much more assimilated, I think. We, um, uh, and the people who contain our genes um, may not speak Spanish, may not look uh, the way the, uh, the, the, the typical Latino that we think of. If you put an image in your mind, who, what is that? Um, we're going to look very different. We're going to be very different. Um, every year, every 10 years, I think you can say um, that uh, the whole population changes in some way. More of us go to college. More of us have professional jobs. More of us um, have an influence uh, on the media. Um, I, and I think by the end of the day, there are those of us, uh, some of you are here, and I know you, um, who say we're going to be just like the rest of the population where we will but because that is the way we are we melt uh, we melt into each other and that is that is just our our um, our, our our way yeah I had a board member the other day at an event he, and he said he was giving some stats on how many Latinos in the United States and the percentage and how many are under the age of 20 I believe there's a growing population but he also said, if you're not a Latino today, you will be in a few years when you marry someone or you, or you have kids or they have That's kids right. and they marry someone else. That's right. So true. you will be Latino eventually. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure where we are in time. We have a uh, we want to move on to questions or I'm not sure what time we started. Uh, let's start taking some questions. What do you think? You want to have anything else? Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm yeah. good. I'm, I'm questions are good. Yeah. There's a microphone up here. You can walk up to the microphone and it's being recorded. So we need you to speak up. Yeah. Immigration. You haven't mentioned it. Uh, and it's important to me because I'm third generation. All my grandparents were born overseas somewhere. So I'm in a godforsaken place in Eastern Europe. Um, and it's the impression, and of course now it is the driving issue that's, that's, that's polarizing the country. Um, but my impression is that um, on immigration, Latinos are all over the place. Um, do you have a sense of Who's where? Are there some groups that are for it, Cubans? Uh, others that are not? Others that are indifferent? Um, I don't know what you mean by oh, all over the place. Um, some some Latinos are thought Latinos are expected to be for more immigration. Oh, I see. What for you mean. more, yeah. you know, easier entry at the against the stuff that's going on at the border, which is directed at Central Americans. Latin Americans, we hear that other Latino communities are against more freer immigration. I think and that's absolutely true. I think I, I, I think uh, you know, most Latinos who are here are worried about the the tremendous uh, uh, flow 
of uh, of uh, Latinos into this country. I mean, even even though we may have come in the same way, even though we may have crossed the border, and I know many people who crossed the border are here, have been here for two or three generations, right? And are worried about the people who are crossing the border. There's no, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's no unity there. I think that. Uh, but do you have a sense of which groups are for? Whether there are groups that are for and groups that are against, or is it just sort of randomly distributed? You need to look at Pew Research. Uh, as who's here from Pew Research? Yes, right. thank you very much. Good. These are the people who uh, answer your question yeah. best. The 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 fact. Uh, is that the uh, the there are very strong opinions and Pew has measured them mm -hmm. of people who, for instance, um, uh, believe in in um, having the f the freedom to plan their families have the 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 uh, who are um, you mean to bring their families. I'm sorry. You mean to bring their families? No, no, no. I'm oh. talking about in in terms of reproductive rights. Ah, okay. Um, there, all of that is measurable and has been measured very, very closely by Pew. Um, the you, it, you can't say that one group feels entirely one way or the other, but um, but I take your question. The you should read Ray when when his book comes out. Absolutely. April. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I watch him on television. <laughs> but you know, Thank just you. a comment on that, and, and I can only speak from you know, anecdotally and from from my experience in Miami. Um, there is a big division, and and, it, and it's sometimes very hurtful. You know, my parents came to Freedom Flights in the '60s, Miami to New York. Uh, my uncle came in Pedro Pan. You know, the Children's Exodus, fourteen thousand kids unaccompanied from '60 to '62 uh, through blank visa waivers. I don't think people know enough about the Peter yeah. Pans. You know, I think this is a whole group of 14,000 Yeah, it's an amazing story kids. when you look it up. You know, I, I, fortunately, we had done an exhibition in Miami on, on Pedro Pans. Um, so from 1960 to 62, after Castro came into power, um, over 14,000 kids came unaccompanied uh, from, from Cuba to the United States. Age three. Yeah, Emily. some of them as, as young as, you know, two or three, some of them, you know, under 18. Some came carrying their little baby sister in their arms. Um, and the thought was, you know, to 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 flee Castro's power and indoctrination. Schools are being schools, businesses, everything was being taken over by the government. Uh, and with the ruse of they were going to go to a private school in South Florida. I don't know how they did it back then, but imagine blank visas being sent overnight to Cuba underground networks, um, Pan Am, Catholic Welfare Bureau. They all get together, and little by little, over two years until I believe until. Missile crisis, right? Right until the missile crisis, right. they were doing it every day. Flights, two, three, two, three flights a day through Pan Am. Sometimes they would go to Jamaica, mostly through the United States, and a lot of camps in Miami were built just to house these kids. Um, but I mention it because one of the incredible things is we did this exhibition that talked about this journey and what happened to them. Uh, very painful story for many, uh, but many of those people that I met were actually opposed to immigration today because it was a different story. It's like, well, Absolutely. my story is not yeah. that. I came legally or I came with like, well, you got a blank visa. It's not exactly commonplace, right? right? But they felt it was a different situation because it was a uh, oppression and Castro. Um, and so it still happens in Miami. I talk to people all the time, including family members, like, well, you shouldn't allow anyone else. It's too full or it's a different situation for us. And we did it. We saw it through Mar Marielle in 80, 81. We saw it through the Bicetto crisis in 94. Uh, continuing waves of, of migrants coming in all the way through the 2000s. I mean, growing up in South Florida, you would see uh, rafts and inner tubes washing up on the beach while you were, you know, vacationing or you're visiting the, the shoreline. That's not normal, right? And then that's something that happened all through the 80s. That's how many people were coming over. But what you see now is tenfold increase in immigration. Um, I rarely, you know, I go back to South Florida every four or five months, and I don't even recognize the last time I was there in September. And there's so much traffic. There's so much traffic and there's so many people that it is putting a lot of pressure on, on the communities there. Yeah. Yeah. So there, so it's, it's just it's regional, right? It's different right. everywhere you go. There's different opinions and not to get into politics. It's just everybody feels different about it, but it's very divided. It depends on. I mean, yeah, uh, the 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 Cuban experience, they, what they call the golden um, passports that uh, the Cubans came with. And still today, if a Cuban co crosses the border, they will be given a special treatment that nobody else is given. Um, the uh, and the, the Puerto Ricans have a completely different story, of course, because they were 
they they were absorbed by the United States. They were taken over by the United States uh, in the war, the wars uh, with the Cuba, I mean, the wars of independence, and they were just taken over. So Puerto Rico is a completely different um, a, a different ball of wax. Um, but thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah, next one. Hello, I'm uh, from Colombia. And I love the Pew Research Center because I get a lot of my research from there. And according to the Pew Research Center, <laughs> the biggest, the largest growing um, immigrant community is not the Latino, it's the Asians. And most Latinos are citizens. And the majority of Latinos actually speak English. So we have these ideas of our community that are a little erroneous. And in fact, like, over the years, immigration from Latinos has decreased. So anyway, um, I love being part of this community. I love finding all our commonalities. But when you come to this country, they put you in this one big sack. So if you're from Europe, you stop being an Italian. You become an expat, not an immigrant, but an expat. If you're from uh, Latin America, you're an immigrant. And they put you in this big sack. And it is kind of sad because then we, we lose all those wonderful things that is a rich culture. So a person from the Caribbean that has a very different geography, traditions, food, and genetics from a person that it's in the South Pole, for instance, are going to be made to identify as the same. And that's disrespectful to the community because it's so rich and it's so wonderful. And I love that nowadays more people more Latinos are beginning to ident identify themselves not as whites, but as mixed, and that's and, and are more proud, uh, prouder than ever. But we cannot let others define who we are because we are, we come from many places and we're very different. And the difference between Latinos, at least genetically, is more different between that group than is they're more different between them than with other groups like whites, Absolutely. blacks, et cetera. Yeah. So all you say is true, is true. Thank you so much for saying that. It's, uh, it's absolutely true. Um, the, the, um, the, the sack that you describe is um, perhaps, um, you know, you, you, it depends on where you, where, how you're looking at it. Because exactly. for, for many of us, it's a comfortable Yes, it's a it's a comfortable association. I'm very proud. And me too. <laughs> of being like uh, being Latina, I'm very proud of coming from yes. from that culture and and from uh, that geography as mm. well. Uh, at the same time, what you say is very true. We are we are all uh, uh, we should not lose sight of the fact that we are individuals as individuals as people from Europe. Absolutely, yeah. nobody can mix, nobody mixes us up an Italian with a German. Um, there are those. Um, those distinctions that divide that divide us as well. Yeah, um, and I teach, for instance, medical students, and I'm teaching them medical Spanish and, and about Latino culture. And you cannot treat Latinos the same because they're medically they behave very differently. For instance, it's a, culturally it, they do also the way they follow your instructions, the, et cetera, the way they yeah. take traditional medicines, and so it, yeah. it's it's wonderful. And it's dangerous to actually put everything in this, everybody absolutely, in the same group. Absolutely. And yet, you know, uh, one of the characters in my book, one of the people I interviewed is this wonderful um, doctor, uh, Eliseo um, Perez Table, who works at the NIH, who runs the very division that is trying to figure out what it is that Latinos share in terms of health. And medicine, yes. and there are things he is finding that that, that there Big is difference. true, and it main, mainly they're cultural. So, so, what are you? What are we eating? Um, what is our family life like? And you can make some some generalizations about that. Um, and so, the the psychology is somewhat identifiable. Um, also, the biology is somewhat identifiable, Fair. and he is finding this out and yeah. documenting it. Thank you so yes. much for your question. <laughs> Um, Linda Carter, when she was at your Library of Congress, uh, she tells an interesting story. Wonder Woman. Linda Carter is Wonder Woman. She tells an interesting story about being from a mixed race background, and she would always get sent to the store to return things instead of her brother. And when she bitched, her mom said, 
your brother's darker skin than you are, they will not accept a return from him. Uh, so that was her exposure. You've mentioned Brazil once and you've mentioned Spanish a lot. The two are not related. How do, I'm, I'm totally ignorant of this, how do Brazilians fit into the entire Hispanic thing? And, and is there animosity between the groups or do we just kind of ignore, do they each ignore each other? How's that work? <laughs> it's a different language. It's a different history. Um, I think, you know, there's, there is, there is, a, uh, I think, uh, a brotherhood there. And, and I think you're, are, are you considering it? We are, part? we are. We've actually had a, a program, a Brazilian program in, the, in, our, in our gallery. And we're including content from the Brazilian community because they asked to, they asked to be included. Uh, we do share roots. You know, there's still colonization. There's still same things that a lot of us uh, share in the background. It's a different language. So we're going to have to tackle that having three different languages in, in our exhibits eventually. Uh, but it's important. Absolutely, absolutely. The the wars of independence make the difference. Yeah. I would I would just say there you will find your answer. The difference between um, and and as I say, of course, the languages. Which um, it's it's interesting. Um, Brazilians can understand us, but we can't often understand the Brazilians. It's it uh, yeah. it works that way. It's a little bit like Italian is the same. <laughs> yeah, better soccer. <laughs> the comment was that we play better soccer. <laughs> so I kind of want to change a little bit. I saw you on David Rubinstein's in interview, and you took the conversation a little bit differently. This has been much more of the more recent immigration. And I was fascinated when you spoke about the heroes of the United States that go back to the 1600s and 1700s. Could you share a little bit more about that sort of history of the Latinos? Absolutely. Uh, I think um, few people realize because we, we um, um, Americanize our names or we become Americanized. Uh, we melt into the population because our accents are no longer recognizable. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the first admiral of the United States, David Farragut, was a Hispanic. Uh, and people, you know, his bust is in the Army Navy Club and he's revered. Uh, there's a, a statue of him on Farragut Square, right? Uh, who, who goes by and says, um, you know, his name was actually Jaime Ferragut. And, uh, and who goes by and says, oh, great Hispanic. Nobody. Um, Stephen Vincent Benet. Okay, his, um, we know the Stephen Vincent Benet who was a writer, but his grandfather was the head of the West Point Munitions Educational Training during the, um, uh, the, the Civil War. And so there is somebody, his name was actually Bennett. Uh, he was born in Saint, in, in, in um, Florida, in descendant of the St. Augustine uh, his, Hispanics who arrived in 1535. Um, he was Hispanic. And, and there was somebody who was running all the, the munitions and doing all the training of the ordnance um, for, uh, for a very important American war. Uh, and, and people don't realize uh, as well that Hispanics, Latinos have fought in every war this country has ever engaged in. Um, and, and heroically, I mean, way back to the American Revolution, um, there was a, 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 George Washington said, I could not have won uh, this war of independence without the help of uh, Bernardo Galvez, who was sitting down in New Orleans and gathering troops in Florida and bringing everybody up from the Caribbean who was uh, Latino and Hispanic and, and the people in, in, in Mexico as well and helping uh, the uh, Americans win, the Patriots win the revolution. So um, the history is vast and fascinating and very often ignored and neglected. Um, so I, I urge you to learn more about it. It is something that we should be learning about in the classrooms of this country. And it's just not taught, not yet. We need a museum, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll change that. Well, that's a great transition for me because I am an educator. Um, so I was thinking as you were talking about the different populations and as you mentioned the data, I don't know the exact numbers, but I believe we're talking about 
a quarter of those who identify as Latino are under the age of 18. So in your 237 plus interviews that you did, who were the young people that you talked to and what stands out from the stories they told you? It's really interesting. Thank you for that question. Many of the young people I spoke to were already combined with another ethnicity. Um, one of my informants, uh, just a wonderfully brilliant uh, young woman who is now, I think she must be a junior at MIT, um, majoring in, in cyber warfare <laughs> uh, at MIT. She's a combination of Vietnamese and Mexican. Um, so many young people I talk to are a combination of some of, of, of two different ethnicities, and they uh, are an incredibly exciting uh, generation of people, um, much more aware, I think, of the uh, history of um, who Americans really are uh, and, and who they are and and balancing a life between between two very distinct cultures i mean this woman this young woman um said you know i'm i'm too i i'm too ebullient for my vietnamese family they find me <laughs> embarrassing and um you know and and at the same time for my hispanic family they uh, they speak to me in english i mean they they assume that because i look asian uh, and people recognize me on the street as Asian, that they're going to speak English to me rather than Spanish. Um, so there's a, there is, a, a, I think, a very aware, very um, ambitious and uh, unbelievably impressive generation of young people, uh, Latinos. Uh, the, the, I think the average population, the ab average electorate, I should correct myself here, the average population is probably somewhere in the in the 30s, the early 30s. The electorate is more like in the 40s at this point. So the, the population that's actually going to vote is in their 40s. And it's a distinction. Thank you. Yes, please. I see doesn't want to ask a question. Uh, uh, another question on the golden passport. Do you have any sense of why American conservatives didn't support a similar treatment for Venezuelans because Maduro is considered a dictator on the left side of things, didn't consider s similar treatment for Venezuelans that were given the Cubans. I think, uh, well, it's not just the Venezuelans. I think the, the, the Cubans have had special treatment all the way through. Um, and, uh, that's, that's and, precisely and, my question, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's an interesting question because you're, you, are, you are right to point out the distinction because we're talking about um, the, uh, I think, the animosity that the government would have for anybody coming from a socialist country. And you would think that the Cubans and Venezuelans would share that. Um, but, it's, uh, but there is a uh, disparity in, in the treatment. Definitely. I think in recent years, though, there is special provision for Venezuelans, right? Well, now there now, now there is, is the um, yeah. yeah the temporary visa for the for the Venezuelans. Yes. Oh, we have time for one more question. Anyone else? There's one back here. Uh, the, the, this is a Peruvian asking the question and is, uh, uh, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and asking the question about the process of writing the book and how, how the book was written. Um, you know, it was overwhelming, first of all, I have to say. Uh, it was overwhelming. When I, when I agreed to do this and I signed the contract and then I sat back for six months scratching my head wondering where, where to start. Uh, and I immediately threw myself into the interviews, which is why there are so many. I just wanted to talk to everybody under the sun, politicians, um, you know, housekeepers, uh, everybody I could get my hands on. And uh, the, so the, the process in the beginning, I knew the history. I had read the history for years and decades. I knew the history. And I knew what had been left out of the American story and that where we were being left out in the American story. What I wanted to get at 
were the actual lives lived and how different they were and, and how similar in some ways. Um, I didn't really start, even though I left my job at the Library of Congress to write this book because I was asked to write it so quickly. Three years is not a very long time to write a book this, this um, big. Um, I generally take five years to write a book, at least. Uh, but um, I then started just by um, stumbling around, really, uh, in the beginning. I wanted to equate, which is something that I did in my last book, it was good training, is to try to bring the history, look at the history, and see where it was reflected in the people. And making that, which, which for me is like a delicious enterprise, um, just uh, taking the Puerto Rican history and seeing how it lives on in the Puerto Ricans in this country. Same with the Cubans, same as with the Mexicans. And it's all alive, very much alive. The history is very much alive in us. Um, and that was a pleasure. And then I started organizing the chapters. Um, and then, of course, I had to go back to the people I wrote about and, uh, and check and make sure that you know, they were OK. I would say that 95% were OK with their stories being told. And some wanted um, pseudonyms. And I agreed to that as well. My publisher agreed to that. Um, but basically, everybody was pretty much uh, so generous in giving me the information and so willing um, to be uh, identified for their words. Well, come to the end of our program. Thank you, Marie. And thank you all for joining us today. Another round of applause. Thank you, so thank you. Thank you once again.